When I was a young man, I read Autobiography Yogi at uh, eight years old. And uh, having read that book and been inspired by that book, I had this desire all my life to go to India. But it wasn't until my 58th year of life that I finally made a trip in 2004 with a good friend of mine, uh, Dave Gallo. And uh, we had just uh, two years prior traveled back to Vietnam where we were both uh, veterans of that war and visited the old places and met people. And it was a real comfortable experience traveling with him. And he picked up on languages really good too. So he'd be a handy guy to have around. So that thought was in my mind and I'd been kind of planning it, not exactly sure how I was going to do it. We originally planned on going uh, back in uh, 2001 and I had uh, set up a tour and everything, but then there was 9-11 and uh, things didn't look like a good time to go. So I didn't go, it was postponed. That spring of 2004, I was at the Self-Realization Fellowship Church in Sacramento. And one of the traveling monastics was there visiting and he was a good friend and uh, Brother Devananda. And he was saying he was trying to get uh, the organization to send him to India. He's never been to India. And he kind of wanted to go there and, and experience it. And he was hoping, not 100% sure, but he was hoping he was going to be able to go that fall. And I told him jokingly, I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you go, I'll meet you there. And so he says, okay, I'll meet you there too. So that was just a little agreement we had. Turns out about six months later, uh, things worked out and Dave and I got on an airplane, we flew to India. And one of the places, we were there about three months, one of the places we decided to go was where the Buddha became enlightened, where he sat for a month, meditated and he found this oneness, this experience where it became fully awakened. And that's a real secret spot if you're a follower of Buddha, this is one of those places you go to, you know, to touch the place that he sat and walked and, and there's temples there from all around the world. There's all these different Buddhist organizations that built temples there. So you got a uh, Vietnam Buddhist temple, you got the Thailand Buddhist temple, you got an, one from Nepal, you got, uh, you name all the different countries. There was about 20 or 30 of them there. So we arrived there and uh, checked into our hotel and uh, we started walking around and it was crowded. There was a lot of people walking around there, a lot of people, pilgrims going to these different places and thousands of people wearing monk-like robes. They all kind of looked the same, little different colors and shades, but uh, pretty much everybody looked the same. And I'm walking down this road in the city and I look about a hundred feet away and I see the back of a guy. And I told Dave, I said, hey, I think I know that guy. And he looks at me and he goes, there's no way you know that guy. He came to see his face. How do you, I said, no, I sense that I, that I know that guy. And he goes, nah. So we didn't even go because Dave wasn't curious. We didn't go, we didn't follow the guy. We went off in a different direction. About an hour later, we're walking around the central courtyard of, of this city. And uh, I get the feeling somebody's watching me, looking at me, you know, it's like some eyes are on me. And I turn around and I look off to the side. And there I see two monks looking at me. So I walk over there and as I get closer, I recognize one of them was uh, Brother Devananda from Self-Realization Fellowship, and the other guy was a monk from YSS, another organization in India. And I walk over to it, and he grabs me, and he embraces me, and, uh, and I find out that this is his last, he's been there for days, but this is his last 20 or 30 minutes in, this, in the city before he was just getting ready to leave. So had we not run into each other in the middle of India, uh, right then and there, uh, we would have missed each other, even though we were in the same place. So that was kind of neat. And the other thing that came up that was uh, kind of beautiful for me <laughs> was that when I first wrote my first book, A Spiritual Warrior's Journey, I had a whole section there about returning to Vietnam uh, with Dave. 
And I thought, this is a great book. He's in the book. He's traveling with me. And I gave him a, a signed, personalized copy for himself to, you know, to read. You know, it's my autobiography. And when he got it and I signed it, he looked at it and he said, why should I read your autobiography? Once you read one autobiography, you've read them all. What can I gain from this? And he set the book down. And as far as I know, he's never read it, even though it has chapters on himself. And so that was kind of like one of those, you know, nails in your, in your, in your shoe type things. You know, it just rubbed me wrong. Although we had a great relationship other than he didn't read my book and didn't think very highly of it, having not read it even. So what happens is as soon as I got this hug by a brother, Divananda, uh, the brother looks at me and, he, and, he, and he's talking to the other monk next to him. And he says, I can't remember what the man's name was, but he, he dressed him and said, hey, you got to read this guy's book. This is the best book of spirituality, a personal journey that I've read. Uh, I, I've read it. I've shared it with the other monks at, uh, in, in Los Angeles. And, and, and they love this book. This book is really great. And my friend's looking at me like, what? We travel halfway around the world. And first person that we run into, a monk that knows me, starts talking about how great my book is and has actually read it. So that was kind of an eye-opener for her. And it kind of tickled me because it, it kind of set the table for that, that relationship there. So said goodbye to them. They left and we were wandering around. And, we decided to go down into the center of this holy place where the Buddha actually had sat. He sat down and he meditated. And, uh, and it's right there to have it marked where he was and where he walked and all that. And so we were wandering around and meditating and doing stuff. And I kept watching all these Buddhist monks from different you know, sects and different countries. I never practiced something where they kind of did that solitation and then they would get down and they would prostrate their body on the ground and then they'd get up and they'd do that. They would do that for hundreds of times, some kind of ritual, and they would be reciting some kind of mantra. So I saw that and I, and I told myself and I told Dave, I said, you know, when we get a chance, we want to talk to one of these guys and figure out what that is that they're doing and why they're doing it. So that was on my mind. And we're sat there, and I, uh, and I was watching one guy, and all of a sudden he stopped doing it. And he was oh, 50, 75 feet away, and he turns directly around, and he looks at me, and then he does, come. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I got a, a picture of the guy. I had to take a picture of the guy because I don't know if you could, you could see that there. That's with me traveling and you couldn't really you couldn't really tell um how old he was he, he could have been 50 years old he could have been 70s it, it was hard to see he had that no age look and he had his head shaved and uh, and he was clean shaven and uh, no beard and uh, he has clean robes but they were tattered worn so they were old and he brings us over we didn't speak Tibetan. He didn't speak English. And he grabs my hands, holds them together. He puts them up, puts them down, does this, pushes me into place, goes through the whole thing by taking me and showing me physically. And so he had me and Dave doing this. And, and he was going through all this thing and explaining everything he was doing with sign language. Never said a word. But we understood him. And it was kind of a beautiful experience. So it was like, here, well, here, here I was asking this question, what are they doing? I'd like to learn how to do that. I want to know what it is. And the guy turns around, summons us, and shows us how to do it. It was, it was really a, a beautiful thing. So we spent a few minutes with him and thanked him and bowed to him. And, and then we left and we went about our business to do some other things. And the next day we get up and we were thinking about this monk and we were talking about him. And I thought, that'd be kind of cool to, to run into him again, you know, because uh, he was kind of a neat guy. So we went to the, uh, there was a refugee camp, Tibetan refugee camp there. And in this camp, they had a cafe in this old funky building. And it was uh, uh, set up where you could go and you could buy 
you know, bread and soup and, and porridge and oatmeal and, and basic vegetarian type foods and, and the uh, Tibetan breads and all that. And it was frequently uh, uh, frequented by mostly foreigners. It was backpackers, young guys from Germany, Israel, the UK, uh, France, and, uh, and some Americans. We happened to be the only Americans in there at the time. We were sitting at a table. They had wood tables in there. And, and uh, the menu was unique because <laughs> it was in Tibetan and English. And what they did was they, they had numbers after one, two, three, four, whatever number it was. So you find English what you wanted. And when the waiter come over to waitress, you would just write, they give you a piece of paper and a pencil and you'd write down the numbers of the items you want. I want number one, number four, number five. Didn't have to speak the language. They didn't have to speak the language, but they, they knew what to bring. And so I had some real heavy, heavy, coarse uh, oatmeal and uh, and some bread that was warm but it was hard it was heavy bread so we had some conversations i wrote in my journal it was really great still we were talking about the monk we told these germans about the monk that we met so we walk outside to leave and standing directly outside the door is this monk <laughs> and he sees us he does this he comes over and he takes one of those white scarves that you see in the Buddhist, you know, that they put the scarves over, you know, the Dalai Lama puts the scarves. It was that kind of thing, right? Puts a scarf on us, blesses us, and then says, you know, ways for us to follow him. So we follow him across the, the city, and we go back to the place where the Buddha got enlightened. And he takes us in there, and he takes us inside this little funky temple that was kind of hidden away that, basically just Tibetans were in. And he goes in there and he, he has us take these white scarves and put them on the statue of Buddha. And that was really kind of cool. And we walked around and he took us to another place where there was only, only uh, Tibetans. And uh, this guy, I don't know what his status was, but when he went in there, all the people in charge kind of stepped aside and let this guy do whatever he wanted to do. And he took us up to this altar where these monks were praying at this altar, standing there and doing stuff. And he asked them all to leave. <laughs> and then we went up there. So, so he apparently had to be somebody of some importance or status, at least spiritually. So we, we had a real good time and we thanked him and everything. And we left and we we're feeling really blessed. And then he gave us another scarf. So the next morning we decided to wear the scarves around Hey, look, we got the scarf. We've been blessed. <laughs> and we were going, wow, wouldn't it just be great one more time? We could see this guy just, just one more time. So all of a sudden I had this thought to go get some tea, some chai tea. Now, I'm not a tea drinker of any kind. And, and I was in India for several months, and I made some, some trips there. Uh, stayed months and months. And I never drank the tea. I, I just, I don't drink the tea. I, I'm not a tea drinker and I don't like the sugar in it and I don't like all the stuff in it. But this one time I decided I wanted some tea. And I told him, let's go, let's go down to the center of town and uh, look around through those stalls where they sell the tea and, and buy some tea. I want some. I had an urge. So we went there and I'm standing there looking to see where the tea thing's at. And right next to this tea vendor sitting in a white plastic chair is this monk and he's doing this and he's got an empty chair on both sides and like he's been waiting for us so we sit down there and we're happy to be with him and everything and, and then there was a young man that was close by that saw this and he came over and he could speak english and he could speak tibetan and he volunteered to interpret for us so this was great. And I noticed that the monk on his prayer beads, from so much rubbing on them and usage, they were actually worn down the point. They were getting ready to fall off. It looked like he was trying to tie them on or you know, uh, glue them on or something. But this thing was the most used prayer beads I've ever seen. And I 
And I told the interpreter, I said, tell him I want to buy him a new set of prayer beads. Okay, so great. So we go into a shop and I'm starting to barter away for prayer beads then. And then he tells the interpreter to have, have the guy sell me a second set as a gift from him, even though I'm going to be paying for him, but he wants me to be gifted uh, and he doesn't have any money. So it was, it was cool. So I bought a set for him and I bought a set for me and a set I bought for myself. I eventually ended up giving to my older sister uh, and I gave her a scarf as well so she could share my joy and adventure of the trip. So there we go. And we, we got the beads and we went one more time down to uh, the square and everything and, and got a hug and got uh, a blessing. And it was just a, a beautiful experience. And to this day, even though that was like 16 years ago, I still vividly recall the man, his eyes, and the, and the beautiful feeling of love and friendship that he gave to us. So that ended up being my experience in the sacred city where I, I, I randomly, quote unquote, randomly met a self-realization fellowship monk who I said to him jokingly, that I would, if he went, I would go and I'd meet him there. And so I, that promise was kept. And then I met this monk, not once, not twice, but three times. And he blessed me and he blessed Dave. Truly a spiritual journey.